chapter 24, we're going to read a couple passages uh, as we begin our adult class today. We're going to pick up where we left off last week on having a proper scriptural end time attitude. How many know we're living in the last days? Amen. Amen. And since we know we're living in the last days, and since every day that Jesus does not come means we are one day closer to the coming of the Lord, it only makes sense that we would live in such a way that we're ready to go. Every day, literally every day, you should get up and say, Jesus might come today, and I want to be ready to meet the Lord today. Amen. This is not something like counting down the days to your vacation. You know, some of you have uh, things on your phone. You get up and say, oh, 87 days till we leave for vacation. That's not what the rapture is. The rapture, that that clock is down to zero. And you should get up and say, time ran out a long time ago. Today might be the day. And I want to live in such a way that if the trumpet sounds, I'm ready to meet the Lord. Matthew 24 and 1. Jesus went out. He departed from the temple. His disciples came to him. For to show him the buildings of the temple. Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? So he's probably waving his arm and waving his hand at all the structures that encompassed the temple. And he says, Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left one stone here upon another that shall not be thrown down. As Jesus sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, When shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So there's three questions embedded there. When are these things going to happen that you're talking about, the destruction of the temple? What is the sign of thy coming? What is the sign of the end of the world? Three questions. So verse 4, Jesus begins to answer. Take heed, no man deceive you. Many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. They shall deceive many. Ye shall hear of wars. And rumors of wars. If you think we're there all right, say amen. Amen. See that you be not troubled. All these things must come to pass. The end is not yet. Nation shall rise against nation. If you think we're there already, say amen. Amen. Kingdom against kingdom. If you believe we're there, say amen. amen. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. If you think we're there, say amen. Amen. Verse 80 says, all these are the beginnings of sorrow. So he said, this is just the beginning of the end time. Now, let's go to Luke 21, verses 8 and 9. Luke chapter 21, verses 8 and 9. We're going to read two verses. Luke chapter 21, verses 8 and 9. Jesus said, take heed that ye be not deceived. So this is Luke's take on what Jesus talked about in the book of Matthew. Remember, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the synoptic gospels. Every one of them recorded similar stories, but they wrote it in their own vernacular. So he says, Take heed that you be not deceived. Many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions. So maybe not a war, but it's a commotion. It's something that everybody's kind of holding their breath saying, Man, I hope this doesn't escalate. It's a commotion. If you think we're there already, say amen. amen. Be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. Now, we started this uh, on June 25th, the Sunday after Father's Day, and we've been going through this slowly and very carefully, talking about having the proper end time attitude. We took some time and broke down what Jesus meant in Matthew 24, 6, when he said, Be not troubled, and what that means. Last week, we started with four end-time doctrines that you should all be aware of are floating around here in the last days. The first one is erroneous, and it is the doctrine that Jesus has already returned. I will tell you, that's a lie from the pits of hell. Jesus Christ has not already returned. The rapture is going to happen. Jesus is going to come back. And if Jesus Christ has already returned, I got news for everybody sitting here. You wasted your time coming to church because the rapture's already happened. We know that's not true. But there are some that teach that and preach that and believe that. We went through several verses uh, explaining how that is a false doctrine. Everybody say false doctrine. You need to be aware of what is false so you can know what is true. The second false doctrine is 
that we uh, went through last week, and I think this is where we stop, is that Jesus Christ is not coming. And in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 through 8, let's go back there and look at it again. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. Peter prophesied that in the last days there would actually be people that would be walking around saying this. Jesus is not coming. You know, hell is just an allegory. Heaven is just an allegory. The rapture is just figurative speech. And, and, and that's not really what Jesus meant. Who are these people that try to explain what Jesus really meant? I think God, manifest in the flesh, has a pretty good enough vocabulary. He can say what he means and mean what he says. He knows how to string a sentence together. If he says, hell is a bad place, you don't want to go there, that's what he means. It's not a parable. It's not a fable. It's not an allegory. He literally means you don't want to go to hell. If he says, heaven's a beautiful place and you do, it's not a fable, it's not an allegory, it's not a parable, it's not a deep, dark secret with weird meanings. It literally means heaven is a great place and you do want to go. He means what he says. And he says what he means. Look at your neighbor and say, that makes sense. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. Let's all say scoffers. Walking after their own lust. So, uh, first of all, I don't want to listen to anybody that's not walking after the Holy Ghost. I want to listen to preachers that are walking after the Holy Ghost. I don't want to listen to anybody that's walking after their own lusts. And that's what Peter says they're going to be doing. Verse 4, here's what they're saying. Where is the promise of His coming? Since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So basically what these people are saying is, yeah, 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 we've been hearing preachers talk about the rapture for thousands of years. It hasn't happened yet. That's what they're saying. There are people that are saying that in our world today. Verse 5, here's what Peter said about them. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, the earth standing out of the water, in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Hey, you think he's talking about the flood here? Yep. Yeah, he's talking about the flood. Matter of fact, he goes on to talk about uh, the flood. Uh, Peter, in his writings, uh, several times he refers to the flood. What did Jesus say? As it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So it is proper to draw a connection between just like it happened in Noah's day... It's going to happen in our day. But these idiots are drawing a connection and saying, well, it hasn't happened for all these thousands of years. Therefore, it's not going to. They're using the same story Jesus used to try to prove that it's not going to happen. And Jesus says, no, no. Noah preached. The people ignored him. The door shut. It started to rain. People died. That's the takeaway from the story. The takeaway is not, well, it hasn't happened in such a long time, it's not going to happen again. That's just dumb. Amen, Amen, folks. we got to get our head out of the sand and realize, just because somebody's on the radio or on the TV with the collar turned back around doesn't mean that they're speaking in the Holy Ghost. I don't want to hear what people say in their own lust. I want to hear what people say in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So let's make sure that they're walking in the Holy Ghost. Praise God. Verse 7. The heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store. Reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved be not ignorant of this one thing. One day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. So just because Christ hasn't come... Or didn't come when some Yahoo said he was going to come. Doesn't mean Jesus Christ is not coming. I'm 51 years old. I'm old enough to remember a couple times back in the 80s. Where some self-promoting preacher said. I figured it out. There's a secret mathematical algorithm in the scripture. Jesus is coming on September the 14th of 1987. And the whole world said, oh my God, we better get ready. And churches were filled that Sunday before Jesus was supposed to come. Guess what? He didn't come. 
And the guy went on national radio and said, I missed a calculation. I found the error. I was off by a year. I've now deduced that he's coming next year on the same day. And he put out another book and sold millions of copies of the second book. And guess what? Jesus didn't come. You say, Pastor, what does that mean? It means this. Jesus said, no man knows the day nor the hour when the Son of Man is coming. I can promise you one thing. If somebody says definitively, Jesus is coming on this day, you can take it to the bank. Jesus ain't coming that day because no man knows the day nor the hour. That's why we have to live in such a way that he may come anytime. So the first false doctrine is Jesus has already returned. Wrong. Second false doctrine, Jesus Christ is not coming back. Wrong. Third false doctrine is that Jesus Christ is coming, but he's delaying he's coming. He's just going to keep pushing it off. And this crowd, and I believe it is a satanic spirit, will attack your heart and your mind for the purpose of causing you to slacken up a little bit, not pray as much, not fast as much, not come to church, because you think, well, I, I've got some time. I've got some time. It's going to be 20, 30 more years before Jesus. He's coming. He's coming. But we've got some time here. We can kind of sow our wild oats. He's coming, and we're going to be ready to meet him, but just not today. That's an attack of the enemy. Yeah. Amen. Because if Satan can cause you to miss the rapture, he doesn't care how he causes you. He just wants to cause you to miss the rapture. We are not ignorant of his devices. They'll say Jesus is coming, but not right now. And these, I believe, are words of satanic origin. Beware of such thoughts whatever day you live in. Let's go to Matthew 24 and 48. Matthew 24 and 48. Amen. Going back to our, uh, where we were earlier, and let's pick back up in some of the later words of Jesus. Matthew 24, 48, and we'll read down through verse 51. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming. So, ha, ha, right there. Jesus talked about this, didn't yeah. he? He said there were going to be, he told a parable and talked about a servant that said, Oh, my Lord delays his coming. He's not coming back. So this is right in line with what we're talking about. Verse number 49. He shall begin to smite his fellow servants and eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour that he is not aware of and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. What do you think Jesus is talking about? Hell. Talking about hell. So the takeaway is you might be a Holy Ghost filled, one God, baptized in Jesus' name, Pentecostal. Bringing your Bible to church, paying your tithes, faithful. But you just think, ah, it's, it's, it's going to be a while. I'm going to go out here and just have this little private sin. Jesus already told you what's going to happen. That's right. You better be careful. Because when the rapture takes place, if you're not ready, you'll be cast out, accounted with the hypocrites in a place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And in case you're not sure of what Jesus is talking about, the entire chapter of chapter 24 is Jesus in red letters talking about the end time. Yeah. Matter of fact, we picked up the first part of Matthew 24 where his disciples said, What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? It is fitting that the very last verse of that chapter, Jesus sternly talks about saints that think he's going to delay his coming. Yeah. Not that the world's not going to be ready, but that people in the church are going to think he's delaying his coming. Friend, I do not want, listen to me very closely. If you have the Holy Ghost and you've been in church any length of time at all, please listen to what this preacher's saying. I do not want to live this godly lifestyle and get right toward the end and miss out on the Lord. Amen. You talk about a wasted life. You talk about a missed opportunity. To live this lifestyle. And live for God. And serve God. And taste of heavenly things. And hear the finest teaching, preaching music in the entire world. As, as a part of our great organization. The United Pentecostal Church. And to have evangelists come through. And preach it. And missionaries come through. And share what's going on. And get right on the cusp of the coming of the Lord. And start playing games. You talk about a messed up decision. Amen. Everybody in here needs to sit up and pay attention and say, I want to be ready to meet God. Amen. 
Let's go to Luke 12, 35. Luke chapter 12, verse 35. Jesus said, Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. Be ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Everybody say immediately. immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them sit down to meet, will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. Let's stop right there. What's the second watch? Second watch is 9 p.m. to midnight. Did you catch that? What's the third watch? The third watch is midnight to 3 a.m. I think Jesus is throwing us a little hint here and he's saying, I might just come while you're sleeping. It, you say, well, Jesus told the parable of two shall be grinding at the mill, one taking the other left. That's right. Somewhere around the world it's daylight, while on the other side it's nighttime. Amen. There may be two people working in a mill over in Asia while you're sawing logs in your nice comfortable bed. Yep. Both of those scriptures are right. Let's, let's, let's not get into this myopic interpretation of the scripture that everything revolves around our little universe. Well, it's going to be daylight when Jesus comes because he said, two shall be grinding in the mill. It's going to be daylight somewhere, but you live here. He also said it might be in the second watch. It might be in the third watch. What do I do about that, Pastor? I can't stay awake all the time. No, you just go to bed at night and the last thing you do is ask God to clean your heart out. Forgive me of my sins, Lord. I don't want to go to sleep with anything in my life that shouldn't be there. This is, of course, if you've repented and you've been baptized and you've been filled with the Holy Ghost already. Now, if you hadn't done those things, you need to get baptized today. You don't need to let the sun go down tonight without getting baptized in Jesus' name and getting the Holy Ghost. Amen? But if you've repented of your sins, baptized and ready to go, then when your eyes are starting to go slumber and you feel that sleep coming on, make sure the last thing going through your mind is God... I want to be ready to meet you if you come in the second or the third watch. Hey, friend, we don't have a guarantee he's going to come when it's daylight. He might come in the nighttime. Let's keep reading. That's verse 38, verse 39. And this know that if the good men of the house had known what hour the thief would come and would have watched, would not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Now, let's say... Uh, Brother Derek gets a phone call today about 3.35 p.m. And it says, is this Derek Drain? Yes, it is. You live in such and such house? Yes, I do. You have a wife and small child? Yes, I do. All right, good. I got the right place. Tonight at 2.18 a.m., I'm coming through the back bedroom window and I'm going to steal X, Y, Z. Brother Derek would say, Ch -ch -ch, bring it on. I happen to be home tonight. Right? A thief would be a fool to give you a heads up when he's going to steal from you. Because then you would know. And he would lose that element of surprise. What does a thief do? How does a thief maximize their thievery? They get you when you're not expecting it. They sneak in and grab something and you don't even know what hit you. You might go days and, hey, I'm missing my living room table. Where'd that go? Right? The thief. Jesus is going to come when you're not expecting it. Amen. He's not going to put a sign in the, in the sky that says, Yea, I say unto thee, I am coming on Monday, July the 10th at 8, 17 a.m. Be ready. Because then everybody would go to church the day before and say, Oh, God, I'm so sorry. And that's not sincere. Amen. But if you're living every day in such a way that Jesus might come today, He might come tomorrow, I want to be ready. Then His true servants are the ones that are watching for Him every day. Does that make sense? Look at your neighbor and say, that makes, sense. that makes sense. Turn with me to Luke 21. Luke chapter 21, verse 34. Luke 21, 34. Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting, drunkenness, cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. When you look up those things, it's talking about unrestrained appetites. Christians can actually overeat. 
There's another word the Bible calls gluttony. We can be overfed. We can, we can partake in, in things that we should not partake in so that our attention span is cut short because we're so overwhelmed with the appetites of this life that we're not sensitive to that small, still voice of the Holy Ghost. Fasting, of course, will help you with that. Don't be charged with surfeiting, drunkenness, the cares of this life. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. I could go on and on and on and on, but I think we have nailed down very conclusively that the doctrine that Jesus Christ is coming, but that he's delaying his coming, that's a false doctrine. And it is very insidious because it gets people comfortable. See, with that doctrine, the devil doesn't care if you come to church. He doesn't care if you pray. He doesn't care if you support the work of God financially. He doesn't care if you're involved. He just wants you to slack up a little bit and say, oh, yeah, he's coming, but he's not coming for a while. And he accomplishes the same goal. Out of the four end time doctrines, this last one is the one that is correct. And that is that Jesus is, in fact, coming. Everybody say he's coming. This fact or this doctrine and faith embraced by the people of God is the only scriptural foundation upon which to build. When, he's, when he is coming, we dare not say, we don't know, because we, we're not aware of the date and time. As I said, no man knows the day nor the hour. But we can definitively declare he is coming. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 9, verses 27-28. And, you know, let me, let me just stay with me here. I know some of y'all are sleepy. I can look at your faces and tell. Some of y'all are struggling to keep your eyes open. But you need, to, you need to wake up and think about some of this stuff. People that say, well, you've been preaching this all along. He hasn't come yet. Doesn't that make our point? Amen. That if he hasn't come yet, doesn't that mean we're closer? I mean, if you'd have said that 50 years ago and you had some way of knowing, I know Jesus is coming in August of 2023. There it is right there. It's in the scripture. And it's 50 years from now. I got 50 years. You might have a point. But since no man knows the day nor the hour, yeah. and since we have to live every day in such a way, doesn't it make our point even stronger? That every day Jesus doesn't come means we're one day closer to the day he will come. To me, that makes sense. Right. Hebrews 9, 27, 28. As it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. Everybody say appointment. appointment. There's coming an appointment. Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. Look at this, verse 28. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. We call this the second coming of Christ. There's really three comings of Christ. You don't hear this talked about a whole lot, probably because it confuses people. But the first coming was Jesus being born of a virgin. The second coming is the rapture. The third coming is when we come back with him, the raptured saints come back with the Messiah, and we rescue the Jewish people at the Battle of Armageddon. That's the third coming. So this second coming is going to happen. Verse 27, Paul said, you may die. Verse 28, he says, or you may go up in the rapture. Either one, there's an appointment. It is going to happen. Definitively. Let's go to chapter 10. Next page. Chapter 10, verse 34. For ye had compassion of me in my bonds, and took joy, joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring Substance. So Paul is complimenting the Jewish people here, saying, I am your bishop, I'm your pastor, I'm in prison, and you folks have been very generous to support me while I've been in prison, knowing that heaven's going to be a, a great place. Verse 35, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while. Everybody say a little while. A little while. He that shall come, will come, and will not tarry. Now, if it was a little while when Paul is writing prior to A.D. 100, and today it's 2023, if it was a little while back then and now it's 2023, how close do you think we are? 
Certainly not close enough to be playing games. Somebody say amen. amen. Friend, I don't know how to say it any other way. If you're in church this morning, obviously I'm glad you're here. You've made the right decision to get out of bed and bring your rear into church. You're in the right place. But I also need to warn you, if you're playing games, you are literally playing Russian roulette. You are literally playing games with your soul. You don't have any extra days to fool around. If you've got secret sin in your life, if there's something going on that you think nobody else knows about and you've successfully been able to hide it for a while, let me stop and say this, that every man's sins are going to be declared from the housetop. And be sure your sin will find you out, the Bible says. But maybe you've been really good at masking it for a while. I've come to tell you, you need to on your own get that out of your spirit. And don't wait till you get caught. Because if the Lord comes, you're not going to go up in the rapture with unrepented sin in your life. And by then it's too late. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 18. And the Lord shall deliver me, 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse number 18. From every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. Boy, I like what Paul said there. Paul's writing to Timothy and he says, you know what? I'm living for God. I'm serving God. I got the Holy Ghost. I've been baptized in Jesus' name. I'm an apostle for Christ. And God is going to preserve me and he's going to take me to his heavenly kingdom. Amen. That ought to be how you and I live every day. Not living for God out of fear because we don't want to go to hell, but living for God out of hope because we do want to go to heaven. Amen. Now, let me transition here into some end time distractions. And I want everybody to really pay attention here because in every church there are people that are struggling with distractions. Distractions that will cause you, if you're not careful, to miss the rapture. Some of them are not even sinful. Some of them are legitimate things like your job. You have to work. You have to support your family. But if you don't keep a right balance in life, that could be a distraction to you. Family members. It's not wrong to love family, but sometimes I've seen people lose balance and they love family and they spend more time with family than they do in their personal walk with God. That's a distraction to you. Say, well, I can't take them out of my... No, no, no. Don't take them out of your life. Just learn how to have a proper balance and put God first. Amen. Amen. So the Bible lets us know that there will be false doctrines relative to Christ's coming. We've gone over those false doctrines. There are three of them. The one true doctrine being Jesus Christ, Christ is coming. Then there will also be distractions. In Paul's day, as well as our day, they were distracted and troubled by what some people called another gospel. Let's go to Galatians chapter 1 and we'll start in verse number 6. Galatians chapter 1 verse number 6. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Then verse 7, Paul says, which is not another. So he's saying, look, some of y'all listening to this other gospel, and I'm going to tell you, it's really not, in, there really is not any other gospel. There's only one gospel. Amen. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Everybody say the gospel of Christ. The gospel of Christ. So there's only one gospel of Christ. There are other Gospels that are false, there is one gospel of Christ. Verse 8, listen closely. Though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached, let him be accursed. There is a certain church organization that talks about how they have a book that was given to them by an angel. I think so. Not being ugly or mean, they're good people. But does the Bible not tell us? Do you want to listen to an accursed angel? Who wants to take the words of an accursed angel and try to make it to heaven on the words of an accursed angel? Raise your hand. Not me, buddy. I want to take the pure words of Jesus over an accursed angel any day. You say, Pastor, you shouldn't say that. I'm going to say it because it's in the Bible. I'm reading it right here. Clearly, Paul said, let him be accursed. Now, in the Bible, there's this there's this philosophy that if something is mentioned twice we call it the twice mention rule if something is mentioned twice especially in repetition it's put there for emphasis purposes look at verse 9 as we said before so say I now again if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received let him be accursed aha so Paul mentions it twice 
But look at the nuance here. Verse number 8, he says, if it's an angel, he's going to be accursed. Verse number 9, he says, if it's a man, he's going to be accursed. No matter whether it's an angelic being or a human being, Paul said, if it's not the words of God, you don't listen to the words coming out of their mouth. Because they are accursed. Amen. How many times on Christian radio or TBN or some other one of these goofy channels does the preacher get up and say, I've got a, a personal revelation. God just gave this to me, and this is not in the Bible, but it's a personal revelation. Friend, if it ain't in that book, right off the bat, you, you need to say, ah, I'm tra- changing this channel because if it's, it's not a word from God, I don't want it. If it's a word from a man or an angel and it violates the Scripture, it's cursed. That's a very simple test. You run everything through that rubric. You run everything through that template, and you will protect yourself and your family. Somebody say amen. Amen. Any teaching appearing on the scene should either, number one, be established as biblical when it is taught and obeyed, or number two, be rejected as unscriptural, then taught against and refused. For 27 years now, next month, I have been preaching the Word of God. I don't preach my personal opinion, I don't preach out of Time Magazine, Reader's Digest, I don't preach out of National Geographic, I don't bring you stuff and say, I just think this is a good thing. I'm going to give you book, chapter, and verse for it. And a lot of times, sometimes whether we like it or not, we're going to look at it and say, this is what the Bible says. Now, what you and I have to do is get our flesh under subjection and say, okay, I really don't like that. I don't like the way it feels. I don't like the way it sounds. But that I'm reading it. He's right. It's in the Bible. And we're going to have to obey it. Somebody say amen. Amen. You can go other places where maybe you can hear something a little softer preached. Not that we're harsh or mean. We're not. But you can go other places where you're not going to hear certain things preached at all. I'm just going to go over here because, oh, okay. All right. When the trumpet sounds, let's see who goes. What do you mean, Pastor? I mean, what I mean is you got one shot at it. Why take a risk? That's what I mean. That's right. So you think about your actions, and you think about if you want to go to the first soft, ch- soap church, soft soap church over here on the corner where sin is never preached against, people never get baptized in Jesus' name, there's no holiness ever taught, there's no repentance, nobody's in the altar praying and crying, the preacher never talks about the oneness of God, it's just warm, fuzzy, we're just a big family, kumbaya, let's all shake hands and love each other and we're going to heaven. You want to roll the die and take a risk with your soul? You go right ahead. I want to be in a church where the truth is preached. It might ruffle my feathers a little bit, but at the end of the day, if it's done in love, I know it's the truth. It might step on my toes a little bit, but at the end of the day, if it's done in love, I know it's the truth. I want to go to heaven. I don't know why you're here today, but I want to go to heaven. That's that's why I am in church. I want to go to heaven. Somebody say amen. amen. Acts 15, 24. Let's go there. Let me give you an example here. There was a dilemma in the church over an unsettled question. And they settled the matter quickly so the body of Christ would not be troubled. This was the issue of circumcision. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your soul, saying, ye must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. Let me just uh, quickly tell you, uh, the old school Jewish people that had got the Holy Ghost, got baptized in Jesus' name, were now in the truth. And they had incorporated the Old Testament doctrine of circumcision into the New Testament church. Now we had Gentiles coming in the church, getting baptized, getting the Holy Ghost. And the old school Jews were telling the new Gentiles, you got to be circumcised or you're not going to heaven. And it was causing a problem in the church. The apostles got together and said, what are we going to do about this? We know now we're under another dispensation. The Jews are right that up to a certain point circumcision was important. But now in the New Testament, it's circumcision of the heart, not of the flesh. So the apostles had to settle that issue. There are some issues that you might not have book, chapter, and verse 4. But the pulpit has got to settle it as scripturally as possible. So that there's peace and harmony in the church. Amen. Amen. So there are many things that we take a biblical stand on because we have book, chapter, and verse for it. There are some things that we don't have book, chapter, and verse for it, it, but we have a principle. And we preach the principle. 
Can I give you an example? Nowhere in the Bible does it say, thou shalt not snort cocaine. But the Bible does say, your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, thou shalt not drink Johnny Walker. But it does say to avoid strong drink because it's a mocker. So we have a principle. We can extrapolate from that principle down into the substance of that principle. And the whole goal is to keep people clean and pure and on their way to heaven. Somebody say amen. Amen. Now, some think a forged letter had been sent to Thessalonica under the guise of being from Paul. I'm going to go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. If such a letter did indeed exist, and apparently some type of spirit or rumor or letter had affected the Thessalonica church. Turn with me to 2 Thessalonians 2. Let's go over this very unique circumstance here that uh, the Apostle Paul was having to deal with, with this new convert church in the town of Thessalonica. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, by your gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Paul's talking about the Antichrist here. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things, and now ye know that what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. The mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming." Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Let me tell you something. I'm not done reading but in the last days there's going to be a strong delusion That's going to be unleashed on the earth. And people that don't love the truth, as Paul is saying, are going to fall into delusion. You better make sure you know this truth like the back of your hand. You better know it front and back. You better be able to explain it. You better be able to talk about it. You better be, and I I know some of our new converts are brand new. I'm not saying that you got to be able to say it, explain it at the same level as somebody else. But you have to love the truth. You have to love the truth to the point that you say, there's nothing else going to get my attention. Because in the last days there will be a strong delusion. Verse 12. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. we got a lot of Pentecostals today that will stand up and look at you in the eye and say they don't love the world. But they sure know all the words of the songs. They sure know all the names of these people that are perverted and filthy and half-dressed. You know, you can tell a lot about people just by listening to what they talk about and what they hum to and what they sing to and what they laugh at. You better watch out having pleasure in unrighteousness. Amen. The Lord said there's coming a strong delusion. And if you don't love truth but you have pleasure in unrighteousness, you're going to be ripe for that delusion. So what was going on here? Paul, there obviously was some sort of a forged letter that came to the church in Thessalonica and they thought it was Paul and Paul had to rest, he had to lay to rest this disconcerting matter. Paul established the fact that before the day of Christ, before it can happen, certain events which he clearly outlines must transpire. Now folks, if that was the case 2,000 years ago, how much closer do you think we are right now? Think about that for a moment. Our day is rife with those who discover the beast in every popular world leader. 
people that set Christ's return date. They scare people with the Middle East, every development in the Middle East. They interpret treaties as ultimate final signs. They make computers the beast. They use 666 in every way. I mean, I've been in church all my life. I've seen preachers come through and say, look at this barcode. There's three long lines on the barcode. That one is six. That one is six. That one is six. Every time you buy groceries, you're taking the mark of the beast. Give me a break. That's about the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. Okay? That's not the mark of the beast. It might be one little piece of the total one world system that is coming, probably. But that in itself, the barcode in itself, is not the mark of the beast. Somebody say amen. But there are people, they want to take the alignment of the planets and they jiggle dates and numbers and Bible verses to fit their whims and predictions and on and on and on and on. And and, and be be wary of people that every time something happens, they use that to predict. Oh, there, there, that's a major Bible prophecy. There are some major Bible prophecies happening, but there are some things that are just life that just happen as a totality of the circumstances. Somebody say amen. Amen. Jesus doesn't want us to live in absolute fear all the time. And as a result of some of these antics, there are people that are disillusioned, discouraged, and discredit the ministry. I have seen young preachers who have fallen into this trap of not learning the core doctrine, the oneness of God, Jesus' name, baptism, holiness, why we believe what we believe. But they like to get way over here in left field and try to be the expert in all in time events. You better be careful. Spend your time studying and getting grounded in the word. In the core doctrines of the word. And let the end time preachers do what the end time preachers do. Those that are older and have a better understanding of prophecy and labor in that area. Let them do that and learn from them. But don't take away from your study of the core doctrine. If you can't give me 16 verses right now in Jesus name baptism. Don't try to tell me that that's the second seal being opened. I don't want to hear it. Because you don't know what you're talking about. Well, it's getting quiet in here. It's tight but it's right. Amen. Don't have a whole lot of respect for a young preacher that will come through and say, I know what the fifth seal is that's going to be open, but you can't give me seven examples of where the oneness of God is found in the Scripture. Go back and learn your ABCs before you start trying to do calculus. Number three, and I'm coming to a close. Persecution and suffering was the lot of the New Testament believers along with many succeeding Generations. Apparently, some were allowing the distractions of their day to remove them from the faith. Opposition and conflict create an environment that is troubling to the saint of God. However, listen, when a child of God suffers for righteousness sake, he is to count himself blessed. He is not to be ashamed or troubled for the spirit of glory of God rests upon him. Now, we are thankful to live in a country where we have religious freedoms and last uh, Sunday, we mentioned that, of course, being July the 4th weekend. I'm thankful to be an American. And to everybody that hates America, just put your rear end on a plane and leave if you don't like it. Just leave. Greensboro PTI Airport is literally 12 miles away. We'll all pitch in, take up an offering, and buy you a plane ticket if you hate it so bad. One way, of course. This is a wonderful country. This is the only country on the planet that people are dying to get here. And I take personal offense when some idiot basketball player says, this country's trash. If it's trash, then leave. Although I do find it a little humorous that that other basketball player that used to trash our country, who got arrested in Soviet Union, Russia, and put in jail for a while, this last time she stood up and put her hand on her heart for the Pledge of Allegiance. I do find that a little humorous. I think she's found a newfound appreciation for the United States of America. I think when President Biden got her rear end out of jail and she was going to languish in a Soviet jail for the rest of her life, I think she realized, you know, America ain't such a bad place. Hello? I'm thankful to be an American. Amen. I'm thankful to be an American. And we have religious freedoms here. You and I might suffer a little bit with people mocking us or talking bad about us but we're not suffering like some places around the world 
Amen. There are villages in Nigeria that have been burnt to the ground by Muslims because there were Christians there baptizing in Jesus' name. Last I checked, none of us have had our house burnt to the ground because we came to church at an apostolic church. We are privileged to live in this nation. But just because you and I don't see some of these persecutions happening ourselves doesn't mean it's not happening around the world. And we should be keenly aware of that and realize that is part and parcel of the end time. I'm going to have to stop. We've run out of time. Thank you for your attention. Is anybody learning anything? Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. God bless you. So good to be in the house of the Lord on this Sunday morning. I love Sunday school. Amen. Sunday school is a very vital part of every church's spiritual health. And thank you for supporting your local Sunday school class. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for one more day to be in your house on this hot July summer morning, God. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Thank you for our church family. Thank you for the privilege to get up this morning and be alive and come to church. And Lord, we're talking about the coming of the Lord here these last few classes. And Lord, I want to live every day in such a way that I'm ready to meet you. Don't let there be any distractions in my life that would trip me up, that would cause me to lose my focus. Lord, there's nothing in this planet that's worth being lost over. And I pray that every single one of us would tighten up what needs to be tightened up that we would loosen areas in our life that need to be loosened, and that we would be refocused as a result of these scriptures and this lesson. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.